do so. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't like when people talk nonstop. So, I, you know, I, I don't want to do that either. Um, but I am going to share my screen at this stage. Please let me know if you're not seeing it. Um, but hopefully you are. Um, and I, today, um, based on what Jennifer told me, um, what you might be interested in hearing about, um, I actually pulled um, from a presentation I do um, once in a while to schools, um, mainly to, to high school students, but um, I talk a little bit about um, how I came to write the two books that I've written so far. Um, and I talk a little bit about process. Um, I talk about the um, diversity and representation in my books um, as part of this. Um, and so I just thought, you know, at 3.30, after a long day, um, based on who you are as an audience, you might appreciate some of these bits and pieces. And hopefully it's also a little engaging as well. Um, so I'm going to talk to you really today about um, uh, some of the things that have brought me to to be the writer I am, I guess, um, now. But I also wanted to just take a second to um, acknowledge where I am. Um, so I'm on the unceded um, and stolen territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Peoples in um, also known as Vancouver, BC. Um, and uh, those are our beautiful two sister mountains that you can see from where I live. Um, I know you all are joining from different places in BC likely and feel free to pop those in the chat just so I kind of get a sense of where where you're all coming in from um, today. But when I do land acknowledgement, especially for um, this kind of audience, I also really like to share um, some of the storytellers that have impacted me um, and have really affected the way that I think about this place, um, the people who were here before, everybody who's probably here now, um, and um, who, yeah, just taught me about um, the land and the people here. Um, and so this is just a very small smattering of the folks. I'm sure lots of you um, know these folks too. Um, but I have read all of these folks, um, some of them now I'm like so <laughs> um, deeply, deeply grateful to actually know. Um, and I love all of the books you see here. The author is Five Little Indians. I actually teach now to my grade 11s and 12s. We've been doing it for about three years and that's been super powerful. Michelle Good has zoomed in to speak with us and that's been a gift. Now she's super busy and famous, so <laughs> we didn't get her this year. But um, yeah, I just like the amount of impact that that book has made on my students has been incredible and on me as well. Um, so just really thankful for this land, the people who... Are willing to share their knowledge of it with me. Um, just gonna check this chat because I see some uh, folks have added. Um, Chilliwack, awesome. I have we have a little cabin out in Chilliwack. We love it down by the river. Same territories as me, Victoria. That's where I was born and raised. Um, so lots of connections. Super cool. So um, this is something I was like, oh, should I take this out? Because it's kind of like to engage kids and stuff. But then I was like, whatever, we're adults, we can be playful. <laughs> and why shouldn't we also be playful? So um, sorry, let me just go forward. Um, so this is something that actually Simon & Schuster did for me when I um, launched Bruise, because it was during the pandemic, it was online. Um, and if you don't know too much about Bruise, it is, I'll talk about it a little bit more later, um, but it is um, set in the roller derby world. Um, and if you don't know too much about roller derby, don't worry. I'll talk about that too. Uh, but part of roller derby is actually taking on kind of a persona when you're playing it and um, kind of like drag, you have almost like a um, persona name and they're usually pretty fun and a bit silly or, or punny. And um, so Simon and Schuster put together this little list um, for the start of my launch where people could come up with their roller derby name. So I just thought I'd share it with you. Kind of fun, kind of silly, but um, you basically match up your zodiac sign with the last digit of your birth year. So I'm an Aquarius um, and I was born in 1978. So I'm and booty. Uh, which I'm game for. I like it. <laughs> so you can find yours and maybe just use it for the rest of the day. Why not? And share it. Maybe take up some roller derby. Feel free to add it to the chat. <laughs> Um, so really what I'm coming um, from or the perspective I'm coming from here is um, when I'm talking about 
how I came to write these two books um, and the books that I'm writing now as well as, um, you know, how do I use both what I know and have experienced um, what's sort of in my heart in lots of ways. And then also like, how do I tap into things that I don't know or experiences I haven't had? Um, and then where's obviously the balancing act with that. But um, I, I, I'm going to speak to the influences that uh, led me to write Kings, Queens, and Inbetweens, which was my first book, um, and Bruised, uh, which was my last book. Um, and then I'll also speak to a book that I'm working on now that will be coming out um, in 2025. So I start in the beginning, <laughs> um, or at least close to the beginning, uh, when I was in high school. And I talked to kids at least about how I um, really felt invisible in high school, and, and that was for a lot of different reasons, um, but one of the main reasons was that I was starting to understand my queerness and was terrified by it and did not want to deal with it, um, so hid that part of me. It was really sort of involved and, um, you know, not like in, invisible in the most obvious sense, but definitely felt like I couldn't share um, who I was, and so felt invisible in that way. And so that is a really key piece um, in why I write my books and, and the characters um, in, in my books as well. Um, and then I went to university and I went from Victoria to Vancouver to UBC and it was like a whole new world. Um, and I started to discover more of who I was and also be able to express a little bit more who, of who I was. And I found Pride UBC, um, which is their queer group on uh, campus. And then I found people um, who I could relate to. I found um, a place, I found community, um, and I sort of started to um, grow into that a little bit more. Um, and community is like one of the core aspects of, of most of my writing, I would say. At the same time, I was coming out slowly, mainly to friends, but also to family probably sooner than I uh, was ready for, definitely sooner than my mother was ready for. She um, did not take it well when I told her I was gay. Um, and um, at the same time, you know, over time, um, you know, while I was in university and then as I started my career, um, my mom started getting used to things, growing, learning, um, as we all do. And this is us at um, the Victoria Pride Parade, a few years after I told her as queer, she had started to um, be a part of PFLAG, which is, um, you can see what the acronym means there, um, but a group that really made a difference for her because she found community, you know, she found people who were also struggling, um, and she really uh, came a long way. Uh, and then I found this other amazing community during this time. So while I was in university, a friend of mine and I went to a drag show and we fell in love with the performance. We fell in love with the um, energy of the audience and the space. And we really wanted to try it out. Um, and so we did. We put together a little um, drag number for the two of us. And we found a drag show that led us on stage <laughs> and we performed. Uh, Millie Vanilli's Girl You Know It's True, which is, if you know Millie Vanilli, it's also ironic because they did actually lip sync um, and got in trouble for it, but it was kind of fun to play with. And so um, we fell in love with that and continued um, performing drag um, for a number of years as a duo, but then also as um, individuals. And I did that for many years, um, mainly in my 20s. And that community was super important to me. Um, it let me express myself in a way I hadn't before and really stuck with me. Um, and at that time, I wasn't really writing a lot. I was kind of writing for myself. Um, I was becoming an English teacher. So writing is part of my life, reading, of course, too. But it wasn't something I was invested in yet. Um, but I did know while I was doing drag that there was a story to tell here. Um, and so I sort of uh, stuck that in the back of my brain and it came out a few years later. So this is just for fun. So you can see <laughs> this is what I looked like sometimes in drag. Um, now, when you look at drag kings and queens and, and in-betweens um, here and now, I'm just like amazed at how our, uh, you know, their makeup is so artistic and really uh, incredible. I was like a low budget. <laughs> 
<laughs> dragging, um, low maintenance. Um, I super, I had so much fun with it. Um, for me, it was really about the playfulness and um, having fun and making people laugh. Uh, but this was one of my my drag troops, the Brown Brother Posse, um, and had a really great time with them. Um, and so this is actually when I would pause because oftentimes there's a question um, from the group. Um, and please feel free to ask questions, of course, too. Uh, but the questions are usually around like, well, what's a drag king? Because I was a drag king. Um, and so then I just take a minute to explain. So I'm just going to do it for you because why not? Um, some of you may know, some of you might not. Um, but the real basics of it, and this is a very simplified version of things because there's lots of nuance in drag. Because you have a drag queen, most of you have probably um you know, know what this is and seen maybe them on TV and whatnot. Um, but the basics of being a drag queen are that you are generally um, somebody who identifies as male and uh, who uh, then dresses up in feminine clothing and performs on stage. Drag king is kind of the opposite, right? You identify as female, which is what I do, cisgender female, <clears throat> and you dress up in masculine clothing and perform on stage. But you also have this amazing like in-betweenness. Um, and I was just telling Jennifer about Rose Butch actually, um, because that's the event I just came from. <laughs> Rose was um, at our school, my school, for the first time we had a drag performer come um, in the lead up to Pride and Rose did this cute makeup um, demo for our kids and they were just, they loved it. It was such a great event, super, like it's, it's kind of what I'm talking about, like the space and the um, energy in the room was so beautiful <laughs> like the kids were laughing and they were so invested in like this makeup that Rose was doing and there was just such good such a good vibe between um, everybody in the room and it was also like a very queer space you know in a much larger not always queer space um, which is a safe place for a lot of those kids right and so Rose identifies as a drag thing, um, neither a queen or a king, um, and they um, are a non-binary trans performer um, in person. And so, um, you know, again, the array, right? And so you can see maybe um, the title of my first book was Kings, Queens, and In-Betweens, um, and I was really trying to point to some of that um, space in between. So just a couple more for kicks, because <laughs> <laughs> this is us um, when uh, we were doing a fundraiser. This is a few years later. We were a little older here. And this is actually us that my book launch for Kings, Queens, and In-Betweens, where um, like these two have ki kids now, you know, like we were a lot older than we were <laughs> when we first did drag. It was a lot more tiring, but it was super fun. We got together, rehearsed a little bit, and did um, one of our first performances again for the launch. Um, so like Friends, you know, lifelong friends, um, again, community, um, fun, play, all of these things uh, would come into play later in my writing career. And then um, teaching. Uh, teaching is uh, my other love, um, uh, in addition to writing. And I've been doing it a lot longer than writing. I've been teaching for 20 years as a high school English teacher. Um, and so as all of this was happening, I was becoming a teacher and starting my career. Um, and something that became really important is um, creating safe queer space in the places I taught. Um, and part of that was creating um, a GSA, a Gender and Sexuality Alliance. Look how happy they all look. <laughs> um, but they do look happy underneath the emojis too, I promise. Um, but this is a few years ago, but we've been running a GSA now for almost 15 years. Um, and it's really grown and it's been really important um, for the school to have that. Um, it's certainly shifted um, things as we've moved into the 21st century um, with some of these issues and aspects. And this particular piece um, has played a huge role in the book that I'm um, currently working on that will be announced this week or next. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and then finally writing. So I didn't come to writing till a little bit later in my career. You know how like folks will always talk about, um, you know, loving writing from the beginning and writing novels as little kids. And um, that's amazing. I wish I'd done that. Uh, but I didn't really come from a very literary family, not a lot of readers in my family, certainly not a lot of writers. Um, and I came through this through teaching um, and through just kind of wanted to try something new and different after I'd gone through a few um, goals that I'd set for myself already. Um, and like I said, I had this story idea 
you know, stuck in the back of my mind um, that grew out of drag that I was like, I want to just try writing about that and see what happens. And so I did. And that led to me writing what I knew, which was drag and my my experience with that and how important it was for me and how formative it was for me. Um, but I also drew from other aspects of my life, like teaching and um, and other things. Um, so, you know, what I knew was that experience of, of not belonging or not feeling visible, um, especially in high school, and then growing into belonging um, as I found my people um, and my place. Um, family relationships, like with my mom um, and sisters um, and other folks, um, became really important in my, in especially in my first book, but then in my second as well. Um, queerness, definitely in all my books. Uh, I don't, I don't know that I'll ever write a book that's that doesn't include queerness as a pretty central aspect. Um, the young adults I've taught and who I'm surrounded by inspire me, teach me. Um, I'm always observing them, of course, um, and feel lucky to be a teacher as well as a YA writer because I have that overlap, which is really powerful. Um, and then, of course, drag. And so that led to um, King Squeeze and Inbetweens. And um, all of these things appear in that book. And so things came a little easier for me with this particular book. It's kind of like that book that you uh, maybe I felt like I had in me, you know. Um, but I still had to do a little bit of research. I got to interview some drag performers because I performed drag like 20 years before. <laughs> um, and so it's changed a lot, especially here in Vancouver, I would say. And um, so that's a fun research, like the most fun research <laughs> is to just hang out with drag performers and and talk about like why they love it, their looks, um, you know, how they got their drag name, their journey to becoming drag performers. Um, and so a lot of that made it into the book as well as my own performances and my own experiences. And super, super fun um, because drag is so many things. Um, and we're obviously experiencing this like disgusting, terrible um, response to drag from folks who have no clue clearly what drag is actually about. Um, librarians um, are having to deal with that um, in a really awful way, I know, um, you know, both in schools as well as in, in public libraries. And so, um, you know, I wish, I wish people could like just give it a chance, understand what drag is really trying to do. And, and not all drag is the same, obviously, but so much of the drag that I've seen um, does this stuff. It adds, it's like so exciting and engaging. It's so fun to watch. It is this amazing way to express yourself. I found a way through it that I'd never thought to express myself. Like I identify as a cisgender woman. I'm perfectly happy being a woman and expressing myself as a woman, but like it let me play with gender and, and dress up as a guy. And that was just kind of fun. I kind of liked how I looked um, in those spaces. Um, really empowering to be able to like own your gender and sexuality in a different way and be um, part of an audience and space um, that like, let you live that way as well. Um, and then boundary breaking, of course, you know, like there's no male and female. There's like so many things in between. <laughs> and, you know, there's, you know, so much in between masculinity and femininity too. Um, and so just really screwing around with all those binaries and the community, as I've mentioned. Um, so lots of reasons I wanted to bring drag to the world in a different way through this book. Um, and I, I hope I've done that. Um, but then my publisher was publishing the book and my agent said, okay, well now what next? <laughs> and I was like, oh Jesus. Okay, well that was the book I thought I had made. Me, so uh, I guess it's back to the drawing board. I had an idea for a book, my editor didn't love it. And so um, I really did have to go back to the drawing board. And so I started thinking about um, things, communities that I was drawn to or subcultures that seemed um, enticing to me because drag is a subculture and I think it's really enticing and incredible. And so the first thing that came to mind was roller derby, uh, not because I'd played it, uh, because I definitely don't, but because of all of these things that um, I loved about drag as well. Um, and so part of Bruised, my second book, includes all of these things, plus this cool subculture piece, um, which I actually didn't know about um, and had to learn about. Um, because with roller derby, <laughs> this is pure fiction. I'd never played it. I never would. If you have seen roller derby, it is brutal. Um, I am a huge baby. 
and I am not a physical risk taker. And so I had certainly seen it and I had friends who played it and I knew that it was a really cool community and had a lot of those things that I loved about drag. And so that's what drew me to this idea. And so um, I wanted to share a little bit of roller derby because if you haven't seen it, you got to see it. Um, to understand what I'm saying about it being brutal and why I would never play it. Although, are there any roller derby folks in the room? Sometimes there are. Oh, I'm just seeing some of your um, roller derby names here. Twisted Cheetah and Scorpio Cha-Cha. Love it. <laughs> um, let me play this for you. Uh, just a little clip of some roller derby, and it's pretty awesome. There is music sound. Okay, I know we could probably just keep watching that forever, but um, we'll move forward here. Uh, so you see, <laughs> you see that you really have to be tough to play that sport. Um, but I was definitely drawn to it. And again, like fun research um, to get into that. First thing I did was watch Whip It, which if you haven't seen, it's a movie from 2007 when roller derby was having this big resurgence. Um, and it's actually, it's pretty good still. Like it, it does stand the test of time, I think. Uh, worth worth a summer summer watch. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a great, great movie. Um, but like, as I mentioned, oops, sorry. I'm going all over the place here. Um, you know, all of the things, you know, that I could say about drag, I could say about roller derby too. Um, you saw, it's exciting to watch. There's self-expression. You saw the woman with the, um, you know, skeletal face, and then they've got their names that they have in their jerseys, really empowering. Like this is almost like a female driven sport. It's a do it yourself, um, kind of sport. Um, it is, uh, uh, the kind of sport that like, you don't really see something like this. Um, it is boundary breaking in so many ways, not in, not in the least of the way that it's, it is female driven, but also it's like the only sport where you're playing offense and defense at the same time. You're on roller skates. Like, that's kind of a big deal, um, compared to most sports. And then it also has this amazing community. Like these folks go hard and punch each other and stuff on the court or on the track um but then you know go out and have beers they they take up and set, set take down and set up their um you know their staging and their seating all together and it's just really really cool but I didn't I didn't know a lot about it and, and so what I had to do um which was a bit different than Kings Queens and Inbetweens was I actually had to do quite a bit more research um I still did interviews because uh, I love interviewing as a form of research I find it a, just fascinating as a human being to be able to connect with other people that way. Um, but it gives me like kinds of insights you don't necessarily find, um, you know, just sort of reading an article um, or more um, sort of traditional research, although I do that too. Um, I did uh, like even just a Google form to get people um, to give me some details, things like, you know, what does it smell like in the locker room? <laughs> <laughs> after um a roller derby um you know what what parts of your body do get bruised the most because that was actually a significant piece to um my book bruise um and and things like that and so um 
I was able to hope understand it enough because the other thing is honestly you saw how tough those people are I did not want to get this wrong I didn't want like a whole bunch of mad roller derby people um after me because that would be scary and so I I mean mostly I've gotten good feedback I think about um you know, how sort of authentic it feels, um, which is really important to me. But with both of these books and the, all of the books I write, and this comes from the teacher in me too, these things are what really drives me um, to write the kinds of books that I do for young adults, um, partly because of how I felt and how I didn't want to feel or how I don't want kids to feel when um, they're younger. Um, and um, and so even the books that I'm writing now, so much of um, so much of these three things come into play constantly or ground me in the writing. Um, and so I always like to sort of end somewhat with uh, some of the books that I have loved, YA books um, that I think do a pretty good job of you know creating belonging and uh, making people feel seen, especially if they haven't been seen before. I know as teacher librarians, you probably think about and talk about um, you know representation and um, you know we need diverse books and that kind of thing a lot. And so these are some of the books that I've um, really loved and recommend. Um, I'm sure lots of them you know. Um, and most of them do have queer content, but also obviously, you know, um, BIPOC um, authors, as well as protagonists, um, you know, feminist stories, as well as um, lots of different genres, too. Um, so just, a, again, a smattering eight books out of hundreds I could probably recommend and that I really have loved. Um, so that's kind of like the end of the formal part of things, um, because that's lots of talking too. That's like such a teacher no-no to talk for like 20 minutes or half an hour, whatever I just did. <laughs> um, but I, I would love to open it up to, um, questions or comments or thoughts. Um, I know one thing, um, Jennifer asked me to mention or talk about, um, that she'd seen in one of my, um, interviews for CBC, um, was, um, the kind of representation that I um, I aim for to some extent, um, one part of representation for me, which is that in both of my books, um, the protagonists were um, either part or or wholly Sri Lankan um, in terms of their ethnicity, um, and that's where my parents from come from. I was born and raised here, but um, it's become a much more important part of my um, my identity um, because again, when I was younger. Um, I grew up in pretty white Victoria, I would say, and um, definitely experienced racism in a lot of different levels um, and and like shunned that part of me for a very long time um, until I was, you know, in my 20s, I would say. And so um, it seemed natural for me to um, make my characters Sri Lankan. And one of the things I've noticed is even within diverse representation, there sometimes is um, sort of this similarity. So for instance, you know, South Asian representation in books is still pretty limited in terms of the type of South Asian that's represented. And so um, I don't think I'd actually seen YA. Um, uh, I'm going to say his name wrong, but um, Swimming in the Monsoon Sea by Shyam Salvadorai, I think. That's how you say his last name. Um, that's the only other Sri Lankan protagonist I've seen in YA. Um, and so, you know, just sort of like fill in the gaps, <laughs> trying like, where are the holes? Let's fill them up uh, with more representation of different types of folks as much as we can. Let's get that critical mass of identities out there because of course, not all Sri Lankans are the same either. So, you know, my Sri Lankan in book one is different from my Sri Lankan in <laughs> book two because they're different people, just like we are in real life. Um, so that's just one thing um, that I've been cognizant of, I would say. But yeah, any questions, any thoughts? I'm going to stop sharing, I think. Um, it's Jennifer. Yeah. I have another one. Yeah. Um, you're working a lot with young adults. So how do they help inform you about what your writing is real for them? Like they can connect with it. Do you have them do any proofreading or yeah? 
Yeah, yeah, actually, um, it's really timely because I just sent my current manuscript that I'm working on um, to four kids, uh, three who are graduating this year um, and one who graduated a couple of years, um, all of whom I taught, all of whom are incredible writers. Um, and um, they're, they're acting as beta readers basically for me. Um, and they, I've done that for each of my books so far. And it has been so valuable uh, because they are really honest. Like there's no hold barred. It's like they've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> for all the years I've taught them, they're waiting to get back at me um, and they just let me have it. But it's like really valuable feedback because they're obviously closer to that age in this day and age than I am. And so they are able to call me out on some like dumb adult assumptions, you know, um, and language too that I use um, that is just a little bit disconnected um, or a lot disconnected from what they might use. Um, but even more than that, they are able to give me some insights into, um, you know, what really relates to them um, or resonates for them and what doesn't. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to what these four offer me because this book that I'm working on is, is um, really pulled from my life as a teacher, as a GSA um, sponsor, as um, a Catholic when I was um, younger. Um, I was born and raised Catholic and a lot of those pieces are coming to play. And so some of these kids um, have some similar experiences and um, yeah, just really looking forward to seeing what resonates and what doesn't. And so that's been my go-to, yeah, for that particular thing. But then, of course, I'm surrounded by teenagers. And so just observing and being around them, I, I, I hope I have some sense, um, a slightly better sense of, of what, um, what they, what's actually important to them and, and, you know, like why their emotions are so big at that age and mm -hmm. to um, honor that, you know, like always reminding myself, even though sometimes they feel so out of whack, you know, like, yeah. why are you acting like this? trying to remind myself that you know it's it's actually big I I was the same way um and it really feels that way at that age and I know you can see me but I was nodding my head along as you were keeping your answer going uh-huh yeah I get that yeah um Linda's asked a question mm -hmm. um thank you um she says she works at an elementary school and the parents are often not happy with selections of soji books um she's not there to please parents um but did you get any pushback from adults in your school community Mm, from yeah. your writing from yeah yeah I'm sorry for that Ugh, it's so so messy and takes so much energy to deal with that stuff um I have had really good experiences so far um, my school community is pretty small um and my leadership team has been pretty um supportive of my writing career um and um, have sort of had my back, I would say. I think they would have my back even if we did get some negative feedback. So I haven't had anything outright. I don't know, you know, whether there's um, hidden cliques of <laughs> parents um, bitching about me somewhere, but um, so far I haven't heard anything myself. Um, I know that there are more conservative parents in our school community and on our board um, who have expressed like tentativeness about SOGI related things like our SOGI policy that we're trying to put in place and that kind of stuff. Um, and that has impacted our leadership team in terms of their tentativeness. Um, so this like drag performer that we brought in today, that was a long time coming. I've been trying to bring in a drag performer for like three or four years, um, had no's uh, given to me and um, had to go through a lot of hoops uh, to make people feel comfortable enough to bring them in. And with our GSA too, like certain things, we have to just go through more hoops than it seems like other clubs have to do. But in terms of my writing the books, no, um, I don't think we've had any challenges at the high school level to books. We had like one parent here, one parent there who just don't want their kids to read this book or whatever. Um, but for the most part, it's been okay, which I feel really lucky about because I know that actually I don't think is the norm. Um, I think unfortunately what you're experiencing um, is more the norm. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about how you all um, manage that too. Um, if you want to pop in the chat or, or hop on the mic. Um, yeah. And as Jennifer said, please do add, add your thoughts or questions or comments about that in there. 
Yeah, I mean, but I have like, I don't know whether you all know Robin Stevenson. She's an amazing writer who lives in Victoria. Um, like all her books are pretty queer, <laughs> you know, and she writes um, everything from children's books to um, you know, young adult to adult. And um, she's been, uh, you know, she's had appearances canceled um, and she has um, experienced definite like backlash. Um, she always handles it so beautifully, but that stuff takes just so much out of you and so much energy. It also, in some ways, like, has promoted her books <laughs> you know like she she's gotten some really cool stuff that's happened out of it but still so much energy yeah it is I mean it is part of our curriculum it is protected and but you like you need the people in place in your schools who are going to like really uphold that like the higher ups I would say too um and and again like even if you have that um soji uh policy and soji one two three behind you um that's it doesn't necessarily stop people from expressing those things which that alone can be really <laughs> upsetting and and tired yeah all the talk in the, in the news about banning books it is super scary yeah yeah and it is a small but loud and annoying group of people <laughs> you know I, it's not the norm like I've said that so many times to my um admin like this is like what you're scared of is like you know a tiny percentage of our community and you're letting them dictate you know, what we do or don't do when there are a bunch of folks who are really going to benefit from seeing this drag performer or doing this event or whatever it is, um, you know, the people who need it the most, we are, not, you know, we're doing a disservice to by letting these loud folks um, intimidate us. Um, so that's what I mean, like, you kind of need that backbone and leadership, especially, I would say, um, which I know it's hard for them too. I get that as well. My publisher um, navigate this. So um, Simon Schuster, I mean, like, again, I didn't have to deal with it. Um, I, and I've not heard anything from my publisher, my editor, my agent um, about any sort of backlash. Um, I, I got, I got um, a little news clip from like a reader in, I want to say Texas, who said that Kings was um, on one of the banned book lists at their library or the school or something like that um that was really one of the only things I'm sure it is like compared to some of the books that um you know Kings is very similar to I'm sure it gets banned um from other books but I you know it hasn't been a big enough issue that I've heard anything from my publisher um yeah that's a good question I'm gonna actually ask my editor how would would she handle it if um we ran into that problem but sorry I don't have an answer for you right now um, how did I find a publisher to work with? So that was through my agent. So I found an agent first. Um, so when I wrote Kings, Queens, and Inbetweens, it was like, it was kind of the first thing I really tried to write. Um, and I was just, I was like, you know, what have I got to lose? Um, so I wrote the book and, you know, wrote it for like a couple of years. And then, um, basically you query, you send out, um, query letters to agents. Um, this is like a very traditional way of doing it. Um, and found an agent. Um, he basically does the same thing to publishers and editors. Um, and uh, we got a bite with um, Simon & Schuster, with Jennifer Ung, who uh, was with Simon & Schuster, is now with HarperCollins. And um, and she really loved the book, and she saw what I was trying to do with it. And um, so I was with her for both books, um, which I feel really lucky for, because she was a very supportive, wonderful editor to work with. Um, me to cry. Oh, what's this video? Should I, I don't want to cry. <laughs> just kidding. I love crying. Um, but, uh, can, Linda, can you just add a little, like, comment on what the video is about? Because I, I won't, um, pull it up right now, but I would love to, to watch it later. Um, Holly, it looks like you might want to say something. Hello. Thank Hi. you so much for your presentation. I have a Sri Lankan student, so I was trying to look for some YA for her recently, and I, your name came up, and that was awesome because I knew I was going to come and see the presentation. So thanks for <laughs> getting that representation out there. Awesome. And I was wondering, um, to counter all the, the fear-mongering of the book banning, I'm sure your book is reaching more students than you know and, and more young people, but have you had any uh, wonderful like little connections or anyone come up to you after a book reading or anything that you'd be willing to share? Yeah, I mean, those are the things you keep that keep you going, really, right? Um, like the they slide into your DMs on Instagram, <laughs> you know, again, with the big feelings, like they've just read the book and they want to share with you what it meant to them. And that's like, talk about crying, you know, like um, those are always so impactful because you also know, you know, like teenagers, man, they they don't tell you when they're happy with you. <laughs> 
they just they don't they don't um show a lot of gratitude you know it's too they're too in their worlds um and so you know like when they do um and they're moved to actually like message you in that moment that, that it, it means something right or if you get the emails and actually one of the one of the most kind of meaningful messages I got was actually from another Sri Lankan kid because I get a lot from like queer queer kids for sure um but this was from a kid who had just never in her life seen um a Sri Lankan protagonist um and you know she she connected with specific things like I talked about my mom's sorry um or it wasn't my mom's sorry it's the character sorry but it was based on my experiences watching my mom dress in her sorry or like making a cup of Sri Lankan tea, salon tea for me and that kind of thing. And those were the pieces that she really picked out and resonated with that resonated with her. Um, so that felt really, really special um, because, you know, the choice to create Sri Lankan characters actually um, for Kings, Queens, In-Betweens, it had to, it was actually really intentional because I had started writing that book and my protagonist was white um, because I had always like, what else had I read, right? But books with white protagonists um, growing up. And so that was in my brain. Like, that's what a protagonist looks like. Even though I do all this diversity work, anti-racist work at a school, you know, <laughs> for so many years. Um, but it's so like enmeshed, right, in our brains. And so I had to stop at one point and just be like, what are you doing? This is not what you're committed to. Um, and so, and then with, with um, Bruised, it became much more naturally because I was like, this is, this is what feels right to me. This is what feels like home to me. Um, and actually culture became a much more important part of that book than it was in Kings, Queens and In-Betweens. But yeah, just, I mean, the little ones and, the, and they're always like the quirky because those are the kids who come up to the GSA too. They're like quirky and quite messy <laughs> little human beings. <laughs> <laughs> and um but they're so like genuine and and um and cute and awkward about it too and it just like you just pulls your heartstrings for sure that's so special well thank you for giving us those books so that as teacher librarians we can get them into the kids hands well, thank you librarians I actually have a line I'm just gonna like plug my next book right now I have a line in the book that I'm working on right now that's gonna be coming out in a couple of years um that it it actually says like librarians are our saving grace you know like because this little kid is that's where she finds her home right in the library I'm getting like choked even talking about it <laughs> but it's true like so many of our kids like our GSA kids are often the kids who are like hiding out in the library or hanging out in the library or you know finding that as a really special place so you're doing the work too for sure thank you yeah of course I see it's an America's Got Talent a group of students that pour out their heart about, oh my gosh, no, I can't watch that right now. I'm going to like start bawling. But I do like a good cry like that every once in a while. I'll, I'll book a uh, bookmark it for later. <laughs> yeah, those those youngins, they get us. <laughs> yes, this is for later. Yeah, yeah but thanks for that, Linda. Um, any other questions? We have about 10 minutes or so. These are some really great topics. Curious to hear what like you're managing to at this in this time. Has anybody here tried any like drag storytelling hours or anything like that, or is it just it's too hard or too tricky to manage that stuff? Hi, Tammy. Ashley, now that you mentioned it, you are trying to organize drag storytelling in the high school. This was a drag um, makeup workshop, oh. um, but it was the drag storytelling was on the table for a bit too, but the kids really wanted the workshop, the, the makeup workshop, but yeah, either, or were any, it was basically any um, drag performer coming into the school. People were a little bit scared about, a little bit worried about. Okay. Okay. I, I mean, I've, mm, it hasn't happened in my school, but it'd be kind of fun to just kind of like put that idea in well with the GSA club right just, just let them see hey maybe that's something you guys want to do um so we have a a lot of kids who are LGBTQ and I think they want to see more representation of themselves everywhere and I think that's kind of nice to see that um, it really does yes but you know I keep thinking that you know it's for elementary because it's story time reading but now you're mentioning it now I'm like okay yeah I think high school would make sense in this case well, and, and there, I mean, you, you know, you, who doesn't love a good story, like, you know, like somebody telling you a good story, like everybody, you know, I use picture books, even in my high school classroom too, sometimes, yep. 
um, as prompts and sort of an opening to things. And, you know, I, I, when I open up a book to read to my students, even my grade 11s and 12s, like it is a visible, like, like sigh and some of them even put their heads down and like they want it you know <laughs> it's so cute um yeah middle schools like, kids love to be read to I think I think I mean obviously there's exceptions to that but but having a drag queen there a drag performer there reading some really cool um you know inclusive book uh I think that'd be a really big draw it's, it's entertaining too right and some of them will like start singing or like playing around and they're so good and interactive with the kids oh, uh, be fun to have that. yeah yeah I mean if you can do it get get there because you're right like just having that in the school today um like some of those kids I hadn't even ever seen at the GSA but they sort of like crept in they were they were curious you know and just knowing that the school would al allow that or invite that I think actually makes a huge difference right it's, it's a welcoming space you're just you're yeah. saying that everyone is welcome and we want to visibly show that to everybody yeah. especially yeah. in this climate right now yeah exactly yes thank you oh you're welcome yeah good luck I hope it works out yeah I'm gonna propose so, that do you do you have any suggestions then about how people can go about interesting their um their admin about bringing somebody in and you said it took three years and what would that look like <laughs> yeah, and I know like other schools who've who've had it easier for sure, um, and then some schools yeah. are still struggling. Um, so it's really dependent upon who your um, people are that you work with, but um, and also who like you know what your other community is like too. Um, but you know, for me, it was um, being really clear about what I think drag offers, and obviously I could speak to that quite easily because I love it and have experienced it and and watch it a lot and have done all this research too so I could speak to like the educational value of it like even like learning outcomes almost and you know also you know pulling from soji and um so just doing a bit of a homework around like the why and and um what drag actually does have to offer um in terms of some of those things I already talked about today um that was really important I mean honestly you have to have patience <laughs> and persistence um and be ready for you know those questions be ready for some hoop jumping um for me it was really important to bring in somebody that I knew would um be really sort of thoughtful and um unintimidating um Rose is all of those things um, you know, had also worked with young people in different avenues, um, so kind of knew their audience. So that was important for me and then also for my admin to know that as well. Um, and and I think like some of the other work has to be done in the school community too before you can, um, you know, just bring somebody in. Like, you know, there has to be a little bit of a presence, I think, with drag, especially if it's kind of coming out of nowhere and those there's no like... Um, pre-work and post-work around it um, that can be a bit tricky because you know who's um, who's really understanding why they're there um, if you haven't done some of that work it's nice to see yeah. faces but also if you don't want to show your face that's okay too <laughs> yeah thank you basically drag we should all watch it and support it and drag performers need you to go to performances and tip them <laughs> and love them up <laughs> yeah are there any other um questions or something you want to share yeah comments anybody else has had like uh experiences with any of this stuff too Michaela uh yeah, just a comment I just want to say you're I th your books I think are the first ones I think still the only ones I've ever read that have started with a land acknowledgement and I just remember being very touched by that and I just think that was amazing so kudos to you I really I really loved that I was like whoa this is awesome this is cool and then I was like oh my god that's Vancouver I'm so <laughs> close that's awesome so thank you yeah that's that's yeah. great I appreciate that. We, my uh, classes, my grade 11s and 12s, as part of our Five Little Indians unit, actually, we talk a lot about land acknowledgements and how to make them meaningful. Um, and so I gotta, I gotta walk the walk, <laughs> you know, trying to um, teach these kids too a little bit. But I appreciate that. Thank you.